Hello and welcome to this Retail Gazette webinar and panel discussion called ASOS and Amazon. What can we learn from them to deliver great experiences? Um, I'm Ben Silito, a freelance retail writer and editor, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. Um, it seems like a suitable time to chat about what great looks like in today's retail landscape. Um, for as long as I've been writing about the industry, and that's just over a decade now, there's been an undercurrent of change, um, influenced in large part, although not exclusively, by the, the rise in e-commerce and the digitization of business uh, and society as a whole, I guess. Um, but, but right now, as we come out of the pandemic, that threw retail up in the air, spat many of the industry's stalwarts out again, uh, and has left the sector looking quite different to just 15 months ago. Um, it feels like we've reached something of a, a watershed moment in the sector. Um, ASOS now owns several Arcadia brands or former Arcadia brands. Uh, Amazon continues to grow its armory of warehouses around the UK, around the world, uh, as well as entering the UK high street with its tech focused, sophisticated, just walk out technology stores. Um, we've picked out ASOS and Amazon for the title as two examples of retailers that are using tech in a very sophisticated way uh, to get in front of customers and, and, and drive sales. Um, truth be told, we, we could have used other retailers to, as examples. Uh, Boohoo, which uh, also owns some of the old Arcadia brands now, and, and Debenhams uh, is one of them. But JD Sports, Farfetch, Gymshark, Zalando, AO.com, Ocado, many of the traditional grocers as well. These are companies that have been turbocharged, uh, particularly from an e-commerce perspective, uh, as a result of new customer behaviours and the rapid shift to online shopping in recent times. Um, but a key reason for using ASOS and Amazon in the title is because joining us on today's panel is Brian McBride, uh, the former managing director of Amazon UK, uh, and until recently the chairman of ASOS. And um, we'll be digging into Brian's experiences and mining for, for great retail insights uh, from his previous employers uh, as, as we progress through the discussions over the next 50 minutes to an hour or so. Um, joining Brian and I is Bradley Howard. Uh, from Indava, uh, software development and digital transformation specialist. Indava is Retail Gazette's official partner for today's event, so we thank them very much for their support. Um, right, um, would, would you like to like to introduce yourselves in a bit more detail there before we delve deeper into the discussion? Um, Brian, I said you were ex-Amazon and ASOS, um, but, but do you want to bring, bring our listeners up to date and let, let them know a bit more about your career and, and where you are at the moment? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I've been in what is now called tech and digital most of my life. Uh, started off in Xerox selling photocopiers, spent 10 years in IBM when it went from mainframes to PCs to, to software, uh, ran Dell for UK and Northern Europe for three or four years, uh, ran T-Mobile in the UK before it became EE. Um, and then my last day job was uh, Chief Executive of Amazon for six years from 2006 to 2011. Uh, great time, you know, a fabulous time to be in Amazon. Uh, and then after that, went plural, uh, to join the board of Computer Center, uh, joined the board of AO and helped take that public, became chair of ASOS, uh, chaired Wiggle. Um, I'm currently chair of Trainline, which is having a tough old time following the, the transport review last week. Uh, and I'm also a member of the board of Standard Life uh, and an investment company called Kinevic, which happens to have shares in companies like Zalando and Tele2. So, uh, that's a kind of quick counter through the last 40 years. <laughs> Great stuff, Ryan. Lots, lots of, lots that's kept you busy and uh, still keeping you busy, which is good to see. Um, Bradley, do you want to give us a quick top line about your role at Indava and uh, explain the, the, the company's position in the retail industry? Great. Thanks very much. And it's nice to be the third of the three Bs uh, making up today's webcast. <laughs> um, so hello, everyone. I'm Bradley Howard. I head up a team of subject matter experts at Indava, and I personally specialize in, in the retail and also the insurance industries. Um, Endava help a number of companies with digital transformation, some of the leading brands in retail in the US, in the UK, and in Europe as well. So we have an amazing um, a view across different industries and across different sectors as well. And hopefully I'll talk a little bit about other industries there as well. Um, personally, uh, well, my Dad ran um, a number of uh, shops in the, in the family business um, in South London. Um, uh, so retail is kind of in our blood. Um, I've worked for a number of other retailers uh, from Texas Home Care uh, to Marks and Spencer before I got into IT. 
and um, I've been at Endava for pretty much kind of 15 years now. Um, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much for, for inviting us. Excellent. Thank you, Bradley. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, please feel free to uh, stick some questions in using the, the webinar platform right hand side of your screens. Uh, and I'll uh, endeavour to ask those questions on your behalf at the end. We want to keep it as interactive as possible. And as I said earlier, um, we, we, we shouldn't be more than more than 50 minutes or so, uh, definitely no longer than the hour. So just in case you're planning your day. Um, right, let's get stuck in. What, we, what we're going to do is take some of the, the key headline changes taking place in, in retail at the moment and try and make some sense of it all. Um, ASOS and Amazon, who, who we're going to focus on a bit, um, you know, they deliver unique online customer journeys from relevant recommendations to easy navigation, checkout, delivery, hassle-free returns. Um, uh, on In ASOS's case as well, uh, very, very sort of good use of social media and, and, and some of the new sort of social commerce tools that are emerging. Um, but I'm keen to get to the bottom of what it is the most important factor in their continuing success. Uh, and I asked this in the aftermath of them reporting some pretty outstanding figures um, Amazon net sales of 386 billion uh, last year. Obviously, not all of that's from its retail arm, uh, but they did. That did include a, a record-breaking festive period where uh, over a billion products were distributed around the world of, of various types. Um, ASOS uh, for the six months up to the end of February, uh, they reported sales of 1.9 billion. Uh, that was up 25%. Uh, on the previous year, uh, and that's all supported by an active customer base of nearly 25 million people. These are these are pretty eye-watering, eye-watering figures, and it sort of sets the scene. But but Brian, perhaps perhaps you could could come in here and um, what what do you think sort of the most important factor in these two businesses continuing success from someone that's that's been at the heart of those businesses? I think those and also the other ones that I've been involved in. You know, I think I think it's a cultural thing about how online people act and think and behave. And I would go back to Amazon. I mean, it was a remarkable company. I, I spent six years there. I was uh, I was interviewed by Bezos, and I flew to Seattle. I spent one day, uh, and I met his ten management team and finished up with him. And it was a pretty kind of a intense uh, interview process. But the one thing I remember from him, and and he quoted it every time I saw him, is he he had a phrase: "Start with the customer and work backwards." Uh, and it really means that you put the customer at the centre of everything you do. You don't think about fiddling about changing a, a pixel or a button or anything in a website till you figure out what does it do to enhance the customer's experience here. So really, all of these great companies I think, are incredibly customer focused. Now look, everyone in retail will say they're customer focused. Of course they will. Every BDC company says they're customer focused. But there is something about that is the starting point for all that you do in, in an online business. So Amazon, start with the customer. You then combine that with uh, data and analytics and really make smart decisions. None of this kind of shooting from the hip, finger in the air, let's try this, let's try that. I mean, everything is A-B tested. It's, it's fairly easy to do. And so a combination of customer, combination of good use of data, and then that, that culture, it's just a, a bunch of uh, smart, fun people. You know, that they're, they're well-educated, they're rounded, they're business people high intellectual horsepower, good EQ, very comfortable operating at pace, you know, using data every day to make those decisions, very collegiate, non-hierarchy, no bullshit, no politics in these companies, very curious, very quick to experiment, make quick decisions, and then if it doesn't work out, quickly change back. So it's a, it's a great culture, very fast moving uh, and, and very pacey. I think those are the main ingredients I could distill from, from all of those companies. Yeah, no, interesting, interesting stuff, Brian. And um, yeah, lots of that we're perhaps going to delve into in a bit more sort of granular detail as as, as we go along. But it gives a decent overview. Bradley, what, what what's your view? You're working with lots of top retailers at the moment. What's uh, what's the secret of the the most successful ones? And and yeah. perhaps not to ASOS and Amazon as well. I think when we look at Amazon, one of the things which they crack extremely well is how they manage their adjacent industries. So if you think about um, uh, starting the opposite to what Brian just said. If you start, think about uh, the, the start of the journey with um, um, with Amazon and how they manage the marketing, the fulfillment, um, their own fulfillment centers, then uh, you kind of got the e-commerce platform, obviously, then you've got the actual delivery. Now you've got the doorbell and now you've got cameras inside people's homes that are then feeding back to Amazon Web Services and, and 
to be able to have the camera inside someone's home is just a phenomenal um, uh, achievement. Now, you know, the, obviously Amazon are not using uh, that live footage for anything at the moment, but to be able to have that trust as a retailer at the beginning is is just absolutely incredible, isn't it? Um, so you've got kind of that broadness, but also I think you've got also the simplicity. And um, I always recommend to to everybody um, to to go on one of the guided tours around an Amazon for an Amazon fulfillment center, um, where they actually do the packing and the picking, um, and you actually see the entire process go end to end. And everybody who goes has a different kind of takeaway point. And the, for me, the takeaway point is how simple Amazon keeps the fulfillment. They have one process end to end, to the point that if you order an item from a different fulfillment center, so the one that we went to uh, is near my home, um, uh, we went to the Dunstable one, and if there isn't a particular item of stock in there, then they literally get the item delivered into the warehouse, it goes onto a, a shelf, and then the picker will then pick what they do have in stock with that new item that's been delivered from another Amazon warehouse. So they don't have all different branches about how to do that fulfillment. And I just thought that simplicity was, was fantastic. The other one that we're looking at a lot at the moment is the work that Nike are doing. So Nike are obviously going a lot more into, um, into the D to C channels as well, but also having to, to maintain some um, uh, some equilibrium with existing retailers as well, and it's very easy for um, for a manufacturer to to tip it too much into the D2C channel or too much into the retail channel. But they seem to have the balance right at the moment by offering pretty much a different proposition to both different channels. Uh, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, some, no, some really really good examples there, Bradley. And um, yeah, I need I need to get myself on one of those Amazon tours, I think, as well. And you mentioned the the cameras in the homes. Don't forget the the smart speakers as well. It's um, yeah, they've uh, they found found a way to to get very very close to the customers, haven't they? Um, yeah, sort of building on some of your earlier points, um, Brian. Um, from your experiences, what would you say are the the sort of main commonalities between Amazon and ASOS and their approach to, to customer service and engagement. You, you gave us that little story of um, how Bezos um, thought about the customer uh, and and lots of retailers I talk to talk about customer centricity uh, and, and that being the key thing. Um, but but what was what's Amazon and ASOS's definition of that? Can you go into a bit more detail about, about, about what they mean by that and some of the actions that they deploy? Yeah, when I, I think about the amount of time and effort they spend on what I would call the whole curation and, and personalization of that experience, because when you're dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of SKUs and, you know, 14 different sizes and six different colors, and you're serving up the mobile phone, actually a customer doesn't want, you know, a, a screen full of things. They want you to narrow down. Here's the four or five things that we believe, based on what we've seen about you, what you've told us, would be relevant to you. And, and I used to think about ASOS, I would think about, uh, Think about that young 23-year-old PA walking along Oxford Street, and she's going to buy a top for a party this weekend. And she might pop into, you know, Topshop or River Island or one of these great shops as they were then. Uh, and if they're lucky, she pops in there. They know nothing about her. And she might buy something. When she walks out the door, they might have a credit card slip if she didn't pay cash. That's the extent of their knowledge of that customer through that very important journey. Whereas you think about an ASOS where... Uh, they know the customer's age, the customer's sizes, the customer's preference. They probably know what the customer looks like. The customer will have uploaded pictures of themselves wearing gear and they'll have used it in social media. So it's a very kind of permission-based uh, approach to, to actually using what you know about the customer. And so I think that, you know, what's the point of serving up recommendations, you know, about white jeans to somebody that has never bought white jeans or will never wear them, you know? So it's about knowing it and using it relevantly. People don't want to feel it's intrusive, and I don't think it generally is, but they want, if, you're, if you've got their data, make their life easier by doing that. And then when I think about personalization, I think about ASOS, where it's a very intimate knowledge of the customer versus Amazon. Actually, Amazon doesn't know very much about it. You think what you've told Amazon, you've given them, uh, an email address, a delivery address, they've got a credit card, that's it. They don't know if you're male or female. They don't know if you're Indian, African or American. They don't know if you're 22 or you're 68. They've, they've never asked you these things and they probably never will ask you. What they do is they use the power of those 
algorithmic bits of data and they just know that people who bought this also bought that and you get these spooky recommendations for books or household implements and they just happen to be the sort of thing that you would actually use so two very different approaches to it but they both spend a lot of time they invest a lot of time in understanding you know what the customer is likely to want and that's the best thing you can do so it's about that whole customer experience make the whole customer journey as easy and seamless as possible because if you don't they will just become overwhelmed and deluged with uh, you know the, the, the millions if not billions of SKUs that you're going to see on an Amazon website every day so it's about everything you do back to my earlier point it's just doing it you know from the customer's shoes what are we doing today to make that customer's life easier or better yeah no, it's interesting and I probably it's just come to my mind actually obviously but Be Bezos is leaving isn't he uh, later this year he's stepping down uh, from from the top from the top job I, I wonder I wonder how much uh, it, I wonder, I hope I guess it's ingrained in the in the organization now isn't it but um uh, it'd be interesting to see if anything changes as he departs yeah I mean I don't think I don't think he's been really active CEO for the past three or four years. He's done the stuff he wants to do. He's very interested in the content business, very interested in Kindle, very interested in Prime. He's not really into the day-to-day -day prices of electronics and stuff like that. And I think that he'll still be around. You know, it's very much his baby and I think it's, uh, and, and he's playing about this rocket stuff, but I don't think you're going to see any material change in the direction or tone of the company with him stepping down. Yeah. <laughs> playing around with his rocket stuff oh yeah um, yeah that, that's that's definitely the next next area of focus i think for him isn't it um bradley does, was there anything you wanted to add with um in terms of the sort of commonalities be between the, the customer centric approach of the of these leaders that we're talking about anything that you've seen out in the field that you think is particularly noteworthy and, and worth talking about now yeah so we, um i can't say who the um who the customer was um but we uh, we recently won um, a, a contract with one of the biggest brands in the world, um, and uh, the way that the um, that brand decided to choose their um, their digital vendor um, was by running a hackathon in a central location. So this was um, obviously pre-COVID. So they, um, uh, they got all the teams together, all the different um, um, uh, companies, uh, our competitors, and what have you as well, and we were tasked with creating a mobile app um, in about 48 hours so they gave us the briefing they said this is what we wanted to do etc etc and we went about um, designing and developing it etc as, as fast as we could um, and and there was a pretty much a guarantee whoever won the the hackathon would become that vendor so it's obviously a really good incentive um, we won that hackathon which is obviously why I'm telling you the story um, but one of the main reasons we won the hackathon is because well, after after we had um, uh, kind of designed most of the apps, we hadn't actually done any of the development yet. We actually walked onto the street and we actually put it in front of some uh, some passers-by. You know, we only had 48 hours, so this wasn't a, you know huge levels of of market research. We actually showed it to a few people and we videoed us doing that that research. You know, um, uh, to get that feedback and we played that back in our presentation and won the hackathon. As that was one of the key reasons. Um, so it's vital absolutely vital to always run any results that you can past the end users past past your customers as brian has has been saying and certainly learned to uh, amazon um i think there is a borderline i think um asking users what they want can be quite difficult and quite frustrating it's very very difficult to do that and very time consuming but developing some concepts and then asking a cohort of users what do you want um, uh, do you agree with this? Um, uh, how would you improve on this? You start showing the, the nuggets of that and the acorns, etc., um, can certainly help. So, absolutely, we see a massive user-centric view um, uh, on that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, everyone, and and I've said that you know you start with the customer, but actually, in many industries, customers don't know what they want because they don't know what is you know technologically capable. No customer ever said to Steve Jobs, "I want an iPhone." Nobody ever said to Jeff, I want a Kindle, you know, because customers can't put that sort of stuff together. So I think you're right, Bradley. You need some concept, you need some idea, and then you can kind of start to, to, to bounce it off them. The one thing that Jeff used to always say is that the one thing we know is that customers don't want higher prices or slower delivery. So you've just got to keep making that stuff, you know, a fraction, a penny, a five minutes better every day if you can. Uh, some good 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 insights there, gentlemen. And 
Um, sort of, we, we've got a lot of um, multi-channel retailers uh, that have tuned in today. Um, so uh, they, they're thinking about very different, well, lots of different parts of the business, many different components coming together for for the greater good. And um, I want to sort of ratchet up a bit to to another another big topic of conversation in the industry at the moment. That's the the changing face of retail and and the the acceleration of of shop closures uh, on the high streets and in the shopping malls of of the UK. Um, it's it's become a national debate. Um, the state of the high street and and physical retail in general, and, and and rightly so, it's an emotive subject. It's it's um yeah the 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 the, cl the shops that are closing uh, are you know, causing quite a bit of damage to their communities that, that where, where they once stood stood proudly and, and welcomed customers. Um, the old the old Napoleon quote of nation of shopkeepers comes to mind. It's in it's in the fabric of uh, of the UK uh, is shopping, um, but but something that stands out for me is that even Amazon sees retail as a combination of bricks and clicks. Um, it, it's opening these new stores. It, it's, it bought Whole Foods, uh, and that to me is sort of the biggest indicator yet that the irritating terms like death of the high street and uh, retail apocalypse that circle around some some online titles and, and newspapers and, and and perhaps those that don't know the industry so well uh, it's, it's actually quite misleading um for me it's how the two work in harmony how, how you manage to blend online and offline and, and that's going to be the story that we're talking about in the in the years to come um so sort of the question around that is um what's the best way that retailers can can blend online and offline and, and make sure that there's seamless journeys between whatever channels customers are, are uh, 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 kind of interacting with them on uh, and, and a sort of a side to that what role can technology play in helping customers uh, be better served in in stores um, is that one for you first Brian sure uh, look uh, it's a while since I've been out of Amazon right uh, so I'm, I'm not completely current it's not that long since I left ASOS but I tell you when I was running Amazon I, I never worried about a single competitor in my six years there and that's not arrogance that's not you know we were better just I just didn't think that they kind of got what online was all about. You know, the, the, the big companies, the big electronics companies, the big department stores, you know, all obsessed with their own metrics. They were worried about light for lights and week on week, you know, it was as much for PR. There was very little customer focus on it. They were looking, I just felt they were looking backwards all the time. When you think today how much money some of these big retailers spend on Christmas adverts, previewing them, putting them out there on YouTube, it becomes an end in itself. You know, did that video of the old man in the moon actually inspire you to go into somebody's store? Put the money you spend on that stuff towards lower prices, because that's what customers care about. You know, when I talked and I was trying to hire people at some of the big supermarkets, you know, they, they saw online as a bit of an irritant. It was like an unnecessary evil. They were grudging and reluctant about having to go into it. Uh, and certainly when I was trying to hire the heads of online from some of these businesses, they themselves felt as if they were kind of second class citizens. So I think it's getting better. People get it much better now. So when I think about online and offline and multi-channel, they absolutely do have a, a, a symbiotic role with each other. And what I would say to the, the omni-channel retailers is that start to invert your thinking, invert your model, stop having a fight within the company between online and physical stores, because that's just a waste of energy and it's not customer focused. I would think of stores and online are both as ways of supporting the total proposition. Don't try and make online support the stores so that they're both equal, they both support a total proposition. Where that sale comes from shouldn't matter. What's the right thing for your company and your shareholders and your partners is that you get the sale. You should let the customer choose how and where it's going to happen. Yeah, good, good advice, Brian. Lots of the retailers I've been talking to lately, <clears throat> and the pandemic sped this up, have better combined their online and stores teams and aren't seeing it as separate as they were perhaps in 2019-20. So it, 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 it's kind of an encouraging consequence of the challenging time we've had over the last uh, last 15 months or so. Bradley, did you have any more tips for retailers when it comes to blending online and offline journeys i'm sure it's a topic of conversation that comes up a lot when you're when you're absolutely absolutely we're talking about this every day and and i think it comes down to kind of a couple of different things one is never underestimate how the importance of social and tactile shopping is um so uh I'm just on an anecdotal point. Um, we needed to get a new sofa as soon as the lockdown had um, had lifted. Uh, so we went into DFS and, and a number of the other different furniture furniture stores. And 
the uh, salesperson in DFS said that they had sold two weeks worth of stock in the opening day, you know, because there were certain items where people want to actually, you know, tactile, um, feel the tactile nature of, um, of what the material is like. And that will apply to lots of different items there as well. Um, on the social side, I mean, how many people really enjoyed Christmas shopping last year um, from a web browser? It's just not a particularly pleasant experience. I'm not saying that Christmas shopping in stores is, is the most wonderful pleasure, but the point is sitting there just spending money in a browser isn't exactly um, life's pleasure either. Um, the second point is we, um, we work with a number of different CPG companies and one of the big challenges that CPG companies have is product discovery. So if you think about, I know uh, the average bo bottle of ketchup or whatever, um, when you um, when you buy that in a supermarket compared to on through a web browser, you go into the supermarket and you see your ketchup in the middle, but actually around it you see so many different varieties, so many different sizes, a new one that's on a um, special discount at that moment to to promote it and what have you as well, or it might be a, a limited time um, uh, recipe as, as well, um, and that is really hard to promote online that new product discovery because it is so easy to just keep on adding items into your basket to, to do repeat purchase. It's very hard to promote new items um, when someone is completely fixated on, on exactly what they want. So product discovery is absolutely key for, um, for, um, uh, for real world shops. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a good it's a good point. Um, you, you you spoke about the certain certain technologies that are needed, Bradley, and um, in a market flooded with new tech ideas and solutions, promising to change the world. I mean, the number of number of press releases I get uh, every day saying there's a, a new tool button that's going to transform the universe. Uh, it, 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 like it's 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 vast. There's there's so much out there. It's quite a tricky landscape for for retailers to navigate. Uh, and I'm not for one minute saying that there's there's not good stuff out there. There's loads of really good innovative stuff that's going to help retailers. Um, but it's just a case of picking through <laughs> picking through a wide range of uh, of of, uh, of of options. Um, it's a good question for Brian. Actually, if someone who's sat at the top of a, of a retail business, what what guidance would you give to CEOs, tech bosses? Customer experience managers looking for the right technology to support the customer facing and operational strategy stuff that we've been discussing. How, how did you cut through that and work out what was best? Was it through good recruitment or did you get involved in it yourself? Um, just looking for some best practice advice really for, for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't want to uh, just come back to the same boring mantra, but again, all of this stuff, I would kind of just start with the customer again. You know, we hear about, you know, augmented reality, for instance, you know, how, how's that going to play out? And, you know, it's it's always promised a lot, you know, but it's never kind of really delivered to me. The, the buzzes today are clearly about, you know, AI, machine learning. I think these are absolutely critical, especially machine learning in a, in a retail context. That ability to sift through, you know, this massive spreadsheet of you know 500,000 SKUs and 18 million customers and find patterns between those elements that you wouldn't be able to spot with a human eye. And so, so that whole working with data, really, really important. We always said that um, you know, artificial intelligence won't necessarily beat humans, but humans working with AI will certainly outperform humans working alone. So that's a technology that I think that every single retailer, every single business that's got customers should be really good about. I see lots of new payment stuff coming along. And again, there's a temptation to give your customer this wide range of uh, payment options. But the more you give them, the, the more you just may confuse them. You know, so you got, you know, we get, we get credit cards, we get PayPal, we get Klarna, you get Stripe, you get TransferWise, you get a whole bunch of the people at the top, but you know, uh, you know, Bitcoin type payments. Again, I would just try and keep some of that stuff as simple as you can. And then people talk about, you know, loyalty schemes and how do you maybe get into kind of digital, you know, loyalty cards and stuff like that. Again, I think you've got to avoid the gimmicks because customers see through gimmicks quite quickly. I still like the fact that, you know, Amazon Prime is the only loyalty scheme that you actually have to pay to be in it. And it's probably the most successful scheme on the planet, you know. So again, is the customer getting what they want from this? You know, I, I got to the stage where I collected so many blooming nectar points every time I bought my, my petrol. Like, you know, you end up buying some bloody 
alarm clock from Argus or something with it. You know, it wasn't really what I wanted. So make it relevant and, and make it all be, you know, centered on the customer. Yeah, no, you mentioned um, Amazon Prime. There's, there's, this, <clears throat> there's a myth that um, customers are getting free delivery from Amazon. And uh, that's kind of the, uh, the beauty of what Amazon have sold there, isn't it? They've, 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 they've got people in with an upfront payment um, and, and now people think they're getting it for free. That's, that's, well, that's well, definitely some doing. It's interesting because also it works the other way. Amazon loses money on the delivery itself. You know, where, where it makes its money is the fact that prime shoppers are shoppers who shop across more categories, shop more often and buy more stuff. Uh, Jiffy's, as used to always say, when he launched Prime, he said, that, you know, it's like a, it's a, an all-you-can-eat buffet. You know, when, when you open an all-you-can-eat buffet, it's always the fact people that are at the front of the queue. And so Prime, it was really the people who were having multiple shipments dived into it because it was, a, it was a great deal for them. So Prime's one of these funny things that is the, the absolute glue that enriches uh, the lifetime value for Amazon. Uh, but actually, the customers are paying for it and Amazon's not making money off it. But the bit beyond that, the, the selection and the, the volume of sales that they get from it is just phenomenal. That's it. And all the add-on services that, that Amazon provide too. And uh, of course, ASOS have experimented with their own um, their own types of loyalty and, and, and different yep. customer propositions. Um, Bradley, what's yeah, what, what's your advice to uh, uh, retailers navigating this market? It's obviously something that you help them with, um, but, but what are the best things for the, the C-suite and the, the technology decision makers to do when they're, they're trying to find the best tool for, you know, the job they've got at hand yeah so um as the tech partners to to many of the the big rate retail brands um in the us uk and, and europe um we are often invited into some high level discussions to, um where uh, one of our customers has bought a new shiny toy or um or a new partner has come on board uh, like both of you received the press releases too etc um and we're often the first people in the room to say why are we doing this? So it's really interesting hearing Brian's feedback before as well. Why why are you gonna bolt this on and, and add another stage to the checkout process where you've been trying to optimize this for the past few years, as an example? Um, so number one is always ask why. But going back, back a step um, into how can people stay ahead, um, I personally think one of the easiest things to do is just keep your eyes wide open. So when you shop on different websites, notice how how the structure works what are some of the uh, the bolt-ons there as well um so i was quite surprised brian didn't say something about wiggle um there you go so i've got my proud uh, <laughs> bottle there um i really like the wiggle um loyalty scheme which is basically three tiers of the more you spend the more you get a discount okay so yeah. it's like a gold silver and bronze type type approach um really simple really i don't need to worry about loyalty cards or anything like that the whole thing is done completely implicitly behind the scenes although as a gold member i've got to be careful my wife isn't watching this um but as a, as a gold loyalty member um it puts on every single price as a gold member this is what you'll pay compared to what everybody else is seeing at the moment so i just think keeping your eyes wide open so um now is a good time to promote you know subscribe to the retail gazette uh, daily email uh, to see what's going on um but also when you go through the purchasing process of any online store or inside any retail um shop I'm always looking around for are there any cameras that aren't security cameras etc is something tracking me at the moment what other techniques have they got what other um um installed digital devices are there um because we do some digital um uh, installed displays so we're always interested to see how those are kept dynamic and what have you what are they promoting at the moment is it a particular product are they trying to move me to another part of the store um there's so much that you can learn just from going through the actual process itself because at the end of the day um we're all shoppers aren't we we're all buying through online channels and, and in store as well yeah that's right that's one of the beauties of writing about this industry is that yeah you, I, I see it from two perspectives it's um you, yeah you, you you're a customer so you, you actually see the reality of perhaps some of these um grand press statements that i receive in my inbox each day um but but yeah it, it does mean that yeah you kind of everyone knows what makes a good customer experience because they're customers themselves. Um, th this might be sort of playing on perhaps what you've already said, but, but um, interested if anything sort of jumps out that you want to sort of grab and talk about. Um, 
lots of the technologies that I'm hearing about that are particularly well talked up or, or are being put to use by by some retailers in a in a in a, in a pr pretty compelling way are, are the augmented realities um the the artificial intelligence stuff behind the scenes that that you know keeps everything ticking over um the alternative payment methods that, that brian's alluded to digitized loyalty schemes um these are all big things i've, I've spoken to lots of the big grocers recently uh, and it's it's all about automation software that's connected old systems to to new uh, and that kind of microservices um piece that that that, that the retailers are really invested in no, nothing really the customer sees but they feel the real benefit of it um Perhaps this is an opportunity to talk about some of the tech that's out there that, that retailers really should be focused on right now. I know it differs per retailer and it differs per sector, but is there any one of those that you think you, you should jump on now and, and, and talk about in detail? Um, I, I don't know, Brian, do you want to kick off? Or, or perhaps you're going to just tell me, focus on the customer again. <laughs> yeah, well, again, you know, when it comes to kind of store-based tech, obviously I, I, I'm not the person. I, I would just say that, uh, think of it two things, um, because the, the explosion uh, in data is happening at the front end and the back end. Front end clearly driven by mobile, driven by smartphones. Everyone's got one. That's how they do most of their stuff. So again, uh, mobile should be at the centre of, of, of your customer experience. You know, and again, for various reasons, people are still hanging on to kind of browser-based websites and stuff like that. But if you haven't got a good, slight mobile site today. Uh, you're going to be in trouble in a, in a year or two's time. So, so really understand mobile, understand social media, understand digital marketing, understand different demographics. You know, the fact of the matter is that you know when you think of Snapchat and TikTok, you know, 35, 40 percent of American youngsters between 18 and 30 are on that for over an hour a day, and, and less than four percent of them watch linear TV. You know, so. If you want to advertise or get to people, think about the channels they use. So front end, customer end, it's about mobile, it's about social media. Back end, it's, it's what was said before, it is about data, it's about analytics. And everyone says, I can't find data scientists, I don't know what to do. You know, just hire a few smart stats grads, get some first class people out of, you know, uh, your local university, just get them in working on real business problems. Because, you know, there are now some great tools out there, you know, Eight years ago at ASOS, you know, it, it was very hard to do data science. Whenever we ran queries, it cost us thousands of pounds. It took, you know, an hour and the lights in the building flickered. Now you've got, you know, so many great tools out there, industry standard tools, industry standard software offerings that there is absolutely no excuse for not being into data, for not being into machine learning. Just start with a small data set, iterate it, learn more about it. It's not a big company thing. Any company can afford that. So you need the right people the right tools, the right data, but but more importantly, I think just the right mindset, the right attitude about it. Yeah, good good stuff. And I guess you're you're all going to be sharing your uh, family's uh, family TikTok videos later. Is is that right? Is that is that a bonus yeah. for the listeners of today's webinar? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, Bradley. Any anything to anything to add there? I know you've already spoken about some of the the technologies that uh, that, that are kind of front of mind at the moment. But just to underline that, do you think anything? Well, anything to answer. To answer Brian's question about um, uh, not enough data scientists, please give Endava a call um, uh, and see if we can help. It'd be remiss for me not to say that. Um, I mean, uh, one example with uh, single customer views, um, which seems to come up time and time again, especially with um, with some of our, our new clients. Um, it feels like every retailer is looking for that single customer view. We like to turn it around, but much more into a business focus, into what do you want to achieve with that single customer view? Because otherwise, it's really difficult. And you know, why are you why are you spending this much effort um, with these systems um, in order to achieve that? So we did some work with um, uh, with Cadbury um, a, a while ago, where um, there was a one-time code on each wrapper. Um, this is all in the in the public domain. And what what happened was when um, when someone registered that single um, that, that one-time use um, uh, code, first of all, they ratched up some points for, uh, for a, a, a competition. But the point was for Cadbury is that they could tell which factory had created that, um, that bar of chocolate, when it had been created, pretty much which retailer had got it gone to, in which batch as well. So it's part of the entire supply chain um, process there as well. Um, 
and then we could start finding out more um, more information around um, the person who had actually registered at one time. So we had everything, uh, the, the complete traceability from the factory all the way through to when the person um, had, had redeemed that code. And then you can start doing some very interesting uh, analytics on, oh, well, actually that person um, we think is this particular age, et cetera, and is eating this particular um, uh, chocolate bar or at least we assume they're eating it because they uh, can see the inside of the of the wrapper. Um, and you start getting some really interesting um, data out of that or the, um, uh, information, um, which then fed back into how they were doing some of their advertising campaigns, um, because for the first time they were able to see that entire process um, and start aligning different types of customers with certain um, uh, size of chocolate and also actual um, uh, a brand in itself or sub-brand. Oh, Bradley, you've you've, um, you've you've obviously had insight into my into my questions. I was going to ask about single customer view um, come next, but you've given some really good examples there of why why that kind of transparency is is so important. But every conversation I have with a retailer, be it an e-commerce boss or a, a CIO um, <clears throat> or or yeah C CEO, um, says that. It, it always seems to come back to the, the the importance of a single view of the customer across channels. That's what we're all trying to achieve. Some of them say they've achieved it. Um, some are on a journey. Um, I, you know, sometimes I scratch my head to, to understand if it is even possible to to achieve it. Um, <clears throat> perhaps throw this one out to Brian. Is it possible to achieve it? Maybe it is from a from an online only perspective. Um, well, did, did, yeah. did Amazon and ASOS ever? Talk about the single view of customer as a phrase. Um, what, 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 was, what are your views? It's not a phrase that we talk about because I think we always had it, and this isn't because they were smart or better. It was just about a point in time. I think most most banks, most retailers, most utilities, most big customer uh, organisations, um, you know, they started back with with systems that came along 40 years ago, and they, were, they, they bought the IBM mainframes that I used to sell. So a lot of people have been you know, held back by pretty old technology, and, and and really what they've been doing is building on the ruins of ancient civilizations. You know, the the modern companies, you know, Amazon and ASOS and AO and and, and these guys who come along much later never had to live through that stuff, so they were able to jump straight to, you know, a, a bunch of simple, you know, Unix-based servers and you know, doing all of the processing for them, and then you get into a microservice architecture, it's a much simpler way of running your business. And, and that's what they've always had. So, so they've always had that ability to do a you know, single sign-on, the same look and feel across multiple devices. And, and to them, that is the basics. That's not rocket science. And so I think it's more difficult when you've got history. It's more difficult when you've got stores and things as well. But at the end of the day, whether somebody's walking into your store or, or, or coming onto your website, you know, you've got to have a, a good view of who that customer is, you know, what they bought in the past, you know, what their history is, what they like, what they don't like. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, I guess that's why everyone's talking about it, isn't it? Because uh, the, the digital players uh, had that that advantage, if you like, as uh, if synced, when they were just single channel, everything they everything they wanted to know about the customer, they 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 could gather and 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 were using it in a in a particularly sophisticated way. And and now the multi-channel retailers are, uh, are just trying to make sure that's the case across all of their separate channels. Um, it's, and it's just for a lot. It's because of the point in time. You know, I, I actually feel for people who are stuck. I mean, look, I'm I'm on the board of Standard Life. You know, one of the the oldest financial institutions in the world. You know, and and we're on a big transformation journey, and it's bloody hard. You know, trying to get from because it's like you can't switch off the engines in mid-flight to change them. You know, you got you got to keep the old world going when you're trying to build this new one. So I don't underestimate the challenge, but the fact of the matter is, you've still got to get on. You've still got to do it, and and your life is twice as hard if you've got that old kind of you know mainframe based legacy but but you still have to have a plan to get out of it yeah um bradley anything else to add on the single customer view or did, have, you, have you said your piece on it <laughs> um i think the thing to add on that is um something which brian said at the very beginning which it is such a such a culture change um for organizations to think in this way of customer first of we might not get it right first time, might take a few iterations, so a complete agile mindset there as well. Um, so being able to think customer first, be agile, and then see how your technology can fall into that. So it's the classic people, process, and technology, really. 
yeah, that's it. And um, I mean, I, I think about it, you know, again, we talked about data a lot, but but I just think about it, you know, that, that customer knowledge has been the kind of cornerstone of what you do. Uh, it's just, think about the contrast between, you know, buying a keyword on Google or Facebook versus doing a, an advert at Christmas time on TV. I mean, a, an advert, a traditional TV advert is absolutely spray and pray. Uh, and, and you hit the whole, you just put it up against the wall and you hit the whole population. And by the way, some of it does stick because you do get to some of the people you want to get to, but you get to a lot of people that you don't need to get to as well, versus the, the kind of more spear shot, the laser-like approach of picking out by, by a word or by a demographic or by a channel, these are the people I need to get to. And, and it's a much more precision-based sort of marketing that, than the, the broad brush of TV or outdoor or billboard stuff. So. And I think just data is at the, the, the foundation of all that. Without data, your marketing just becomes a bunch of random shots in the dark and you really are spraying and praying. Yeah, that's the, the wider conversation here is data, whether you're talking about personalization, whether you're talking about customer centricity, whether you're talking about single view, it, it does all come down to the importance of, of being data driven or at least being open to using data to help shape decision making. Um, I wanted to go into a bit of this and go into this in a bit of detail. Uh, you sort of alluded to it already, Brian, but um, last year Tom Betts arrived uh, from, from the Financial Times uh, to take a newly created uh, data director role at, at B&Q parent company Kingfisher. Um, Curry's PC World, um, their owner, Dixon's Carphone, um, appointed Mark Allsop as chief operating officer and he's been given responsibility for data. In September last year, Steve Pimblett became the chief data officer at, at the very group. These, these are not the first to recruit this kind of role but it does seem to be a more important job in retail at the moment and more more companies are making that appointment. Um, what, what are your experiences, Brian, of, of, of using data to build and grow a successful business, bringing in data experts? Uh, I know you spoke about you know, getting academics in, um, but, but just interested to know if you've got any uh, sort of specific examples of, of, of your approach to the whole data problem, the data conundrum and, and, and what you did within the retailers you work for to, to try and solve it. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes down to just having the, you know, the right people and the right technology to help you exploit it. And thankfully, everyone's getting it these days. I, I do a lot of work with government, you know, and they, they were put as chief data officer. And even they, across all of their departments, don't have a single view of the citizen, you know. So, so they realise the power and the importance of data. So every walk of life, you're going to need good data. And and I've talked a lot today about, uh, you know, the front end using data to market to know the customer, etc. But but data just solves an awful lot of other business problems, you know. Take things like, you know, the return process, for, for instance, in ASOS, you know, uh, online fashion is, is shocking for the returns and, and it, it varies by country, you know, because there's a behavioural part to it as well. In Germany, where they did a lot of consumer protection, uh, you know, return rates are more than 65%. In Italy, they're 20%. In, in the Far East, they're less than 10%. So data helps you understand returns by, by country, by type, you know, in, in Amazon, when we really get into exploiting data, we started looking at customers' return behavior. And we found there was a small number of customers who were returning almost as much as they bought. And we figured out they were using Amazon as a free public library. They were getting books and CDs and DVDs, using them and then returning them. Unless you've got great data, you will never spot those random little things within, you know, several billion pounds worth of transactions. So, so data does that. Data can help you in terms of optimizing your warehouse space. You know, again, at Amazon at Christmas time, we're worried about filling the warehouses with product that wasn't going to be that profitable. So we started focusing on things like profit per cube. What you don't want is big, huge teddy bears that you sell for 12 pounds a time, taking up space that you could have, you know, a 50 inch TV in there. So it's, so it's data can, it's powerful and it can help every function just do better. So I don't think you can run a modern business unless you've got great data and great people to exploit it for you. Uh, great, great examples there, Brian and um, Bradley. Uh, your your view, you've already sort of mentioned it, is that um, you know maybe don't <laughs> don't recruit ahead of data. Come to your company because you can help them with that. But but do you want to talk to a little talk to us a little bit about um, and the whole data conundrum within in retail at the moment and any sort of nuggets of advice that you'd throw out there at the moment. And to be clear, even if you are ahead of data, please still contact Endava. But anyway, um, <laughs> Good, um, um, I, I'm really excited about data at the moment. And I think we are in the middle of a new revolution, um, a new generation of data. And I'll tell you why. Because 
Um, in many industries, we've always used data to compare where we are at the moment using historical data. But if you think about the complete change over the last 18 months, what is the point of comparing your current sales against what happened last year? And if you go back even further to pre-COVID, it's so long ago um, that it's almost irrelevant. So I think we are, well, I know that we are now moving from what I would call batch data processing, where you looked at um, uh, historical data, to live streaming data. And what I mean by that is, if you have got a, um, an e-commerce um, site at the moment, <coughs> excuse me, then you can start looking at live data changes which are happening, which um, Brian just uh, alluded to. So this is selling particular, well, right, so let's change the website, which you would do dynamically to start promoting that straight away. And you would automate the entire process of, of how that would work. Um, so many of the, um, uh, the fashion websites at the moment um, uh, are producing very small amounts of garments compared to um, uh, the bricks and mortar equivalent where you'd need to set up an entire factory, produce thousands of garments, distribute them to all the different shops and then see which branches are selling most of them. Now we're doing that on a fraction of the size, seeing what sells well, if it's selling well in a particular size, then let's manufacture more of those. But let's start doing that this afternoon um, so that we can start fulfilling it. So it's that live data is completely different to, to doing that batch processing. Um, and then the other, um, the other thing which we're doing a lot of at the moment that we're seeing huge amounts of difference in the industry is, is what you talked about in your introduction. There is so much M&A going on at the moment um, where um, you, you said it quite quickly that um, some, of the, some of today's leaders, the Boohoo's, the ASOS, et cetera, um, are doing all this M&A. Now, behind the scenes, what's happening is that those companies are buying lots and lots of stock from the existing companies and doing that stock re reconciliation, understanding what is in the warehouse, putting that straight onto the website so that we can start selling it as quickly as possible because we don't want it to go out of date, et cetera. Historically, um, many IT departments would have spent a long time doing that kind of system integration and that data migration or, or what have you. Now it's a lot more agile. Now it's how can I move that inventory um, from the digital world into my main um, data warehouse as fast as possible so that I can start selling it very quickly. Um, so we're seeing different approaches to how to do that in, in a number of different ways. Now, Bradley, the, the whole data conversation could be the could be the, the topic of of a full webinar, really, couldn't it? And, Absolutely. Um, it's loads of interesting stuff there, and you, you know, uh, could demand led supply chains feeds into that as well, doesn't it? That kind of live streaming of data to work out what what's wanted. But yeah, we could talk about that in detail. And I'm afraid we're sort of jumping from one thing to another, and um, we are we are sort of running short of time. So I wanted to come to the the, the final sort of general question to, to finish off with really um, and, and sort of bring us up to date and um, we've, seen, we've seen a huge amount of innovation in retail uh, despite the challenges of, of the last 15 months um, the pandemic's really sort of fast tracked some some new ways of thinking people have had to do it to survive in, in certain circumstances and, and others have done it to, to take take advantage of opportunities that came their way um, I'm, I'm thinking of you know, making stores, warehouses, uh, and, and, and really linking up the online and the physical uh, operations of, of, of their businesses. Um, the, the advent of video commerce or, or that connection between online shoppers and store staff through video, that's something that's going to stick around. So many big players are now using that as, as a key part of their armory. Um, you've got new partnerships, so the likes of Deliveroo uh, attaching themselves to, to Waitrose and, 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 and other supermarkets and other businesses to, to sort of help fast track their, their delivery. So, so much exciting stuff going on. Um, just to finish off, you know, can you offer a bit of advice on um, long term how retailers can, can leverage their, their store estates to, to, to support e-commerce? And, uh, and I guess, yeah, just looking for a few main tips for those listening uh, to, to, to go away and think about. Brian, Brian, there's lots to think about there, but but what would be your kind of parting shot, well, if you like? I'll give you the usual kind of uh, antichrist perspective on this stuff. I think <laughs> you know, how 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 should retailers, you know, better leverage the physical space? I'd say that's a kind of wrong question. But what I would say is, 
How quickly can you reduce physical stores and sizes? I think this needs a complete reimagination. You know, before the pandemic, uh, online retail was probably 18, 20, 22% of total retail. Now it's up at about 50. It might fall back about 45, but you know, it's, it's never going to be 100, but it's always going to be around 50. So just accept that and then figure out what it means for your business. You know, what is the role of a store? Is it a pickup point? You know, is it for returns? Is it for customer service queries? I mean, quite frankly, you don't need to go into a big electronic store just now, you know, because we all know what an iPhone looks like. We all know what a 50 inch TV looks like. We all know what a set of earphones can do, or even a pair of 28 inch waist skinny jeans. So I, I just think the, the need to go and see stuff that you keep buying, the repeat purchases, you no longer need to do that. So I would be saying to retailers, you know, think about downsizing, think about maybe more smaller points of presence, get into some of the medium sized towns rather than all trying to crowd onto you know, the, the, the Trafford Centre or Oxford Street or, or whatever. Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, yeah, I, I think, yeah, online retail, uh, definitely over 50% <clears throat> for some retailers, um, uh, 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 over 50% of their business for some retailers now. I think sort of generally average official statistics say it's, it's you know, just under a third of, of all sales, but that is a significant uh, jump on what it was pre-pandemic. Um, Bradley, um, any sort of parting points that you'd like to make uh, about about what, what what would make successful retail in the in the months ahead at the risk of um of uh, disagreeing with the godfather of retail of uk retail um uh, i was just thinking um, is brian's last point should have maybe been the start of the conversation <laughs> there it's pretty controversial <laughs> i'm a bit, I'm a bit <laughs> sad running out of time <laughs> along with the new sofa we bought a new tv um <laughs> and we did go into into a shop um and oh my goodness the difference in tv quality um uh, uh in that kind of 40 inch range is massive there are some really dodgy looking TVs there. But anyway, um, I, I'm sorry to do that publicly, Brian. Um, so I would disagree on that. There are certain things you do need to see. And, and I come back to my point on product discovery. Um, there has to be a way to, to discover new products or life is gonna become very bland if we just keep buying the same thing which we've always had, whether that's the same shirt all the time, et cetera. Our, our wardrobe's gonna end up looking like Batman's wardrobe. Um, so product discovery is, is absolutely key. Um, uh, I had a lovely quote from Levi um, uh, on, on another podcast, which was um, uh, they're starting to have a mindset now, now that things are s settling down a bit more in the US, um, they're starting to have this um, internal phrase, which is what would we have done during the pandemic? So stop trying to worry about gold plating everything and looking for you know the biggest programs out there and trying to build the Rolls Royce all the time. What would they have done quite quick to find out what would work like they did in the pandemic where they tried lots of different things and then arrived at a certain um place and i really like that approach kind of that mindset so i remember um you know in, in, before the pandemic people would always say what would google do in a situation like this or what would amazon do now they're starting to say what would we have done during the pandemic and i quite like that approach so that fits into your company culture yeah it's a nice little thing to to think about to to to, to leave our listeners um to, to go away with thank you bradley um that time time has got the better of, of us um brian bradley i really really enjoyed that we've covered a lot of ground really quickly there and we've gone from one thing to another uh, but but some sort of core points that, that that sort of stayed throughout and hopefully that's come across in in the in the in the production um thanks so much for your candid views and, and sharing your experiences of this fast changing industry that we call retail um um, Bradley, is there a, a, anywhere that our listeners could go to for a bit more information if they're if they're looking for looking for more details from you? Yeah, probably the easiest place is go onto LinkedIn, um, look for myself, Bradley Howard. I work at Endava. Um, please look look that up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, otherwise, just go to endava.com and look at our retail pages. Great stuff. And yeah, if there are any more questions, please do do fire them fire them in now or uh, in the aftermath. Please please send them uh, via via Retail Gazette as well. Um, but yeah, as I say, time has got the better of us. I need to bring things to a close. I reiterate my thanks to Brian Bradley and Ndava uh, for enabling us to host a, a great discussion uh, and to say thank you to to all of you for listening in. Uh, we've had hundreds of sign ups today, so it's clearly a, a topic that resonates. Um, and we do hope this has been of value to you. Um, but all that's left for me to say is all the best and bye for now.
Thank you and goodbye. Cheers all. Thanks very much. Thank you.